in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those words were first penned a thousand years before the ancient Greeks even learned how to read. Over 3,500 years ago, God revealed himself to us, and in a startling way. It changed everything we thought about philosophy and everything we thought about theology. This definition of God changed everything. See, one of the things it did was not only showed God in a radical new way that people had never conceived of before, but also offered a logical proof of his own existence. They might wonder, well, how can that possibly be? Well, it turns out that there are some things that are true by definition. Take, for example, the word reality. The word reality is actually defined as that which actually exists. That which actually exists equals reality. Reality equals that which actually exists. Now, you can say reality doesn't exist, but because the word reality is defined as that which does, you're just talking nonsense. The same idea that things can be true by definition is the basis of all mathematics. One plus one equals two, partially because the whole definition of two-ness, two-natunity, two, is one-on-one. -on -one. one plus one equals two, two equals one-on-one. -on -one. Well, at the very beginning of the Bible, what we find is that the very word God is being defined as that which created the universe. That which created the universe equals God. So whatever created the universe, whatever that something, that creative force is, that is how God is defined. In this way, God exists by definition. Now, you might wonder, well, hold a second. What if the universe was never created? Then that would sort of undo things, wouldn't it? And it would. Uh, but here's the thing. Everything we know about science, logic, math, and philosophy point us to the fact that the universe was created. And if, even if we didn't look at all the phenomenal evidence we have for the Big Bang, we have something in physics uh, known as the law of thermodynamics, the second law. And the second law of thermodynamics basically says that the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. While stars last for a very long time, they don't last forever and they burn up. If the universe always was, if it never had a beginning, then logically the universe would have run out of energy by now. And because of a quirk of math and how infinities work, the universe would have already run out of energy an infinite amount of time ago. Well, since the stars obviously haven't all burned out and there still is usable energy, the second law leads us to the conclusion that the universe had a definite beginning. The universe was created. Now, some will concede that. Okay, yeah, the universe was created. All of the facts, the evidence leads us to that conclusion. But that doesn't mean anything had to create it. We have something that I would probably call the strong atheist position. And that is that the universe was created by nothing whatsoever. That it simply just popped into existence. Now, I sort of wonder about that. Uh, does this actually make sense? If I walk into my kitchen and I see a glass of milk tipped over and spilt on the table, is the best explanation for that that nothing whatsoever literally caused that glass to tip over? That non-existent things have the ability to push things over? Well, no, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's not a really good explanation. Well, how is it that we'd conclude that for the universe, that nothing whatsoever, something that doesn't even exist, has the ability to create a universe that does? How does that happen? And if things can just pop into existence for no reason, why don't we see this all the time? As noted philosopher William Lane Craig says, why don't bicycles and Beethoven and root beer, root beer just pop into existence? Why is it just that universes seem to be popping into existence? You see, this is something that's worse than believing in magic. At least when you believe in magic, there's a magician and there's a hat. Uh, but believing that things just pop into existence for no cause whatsoever just isn't particularly reasonable. And oddly enough, uh, celebrated atheist Richard Dawkins concedes this particular point. 
And he says that even if we do give the creator of the universe the name God, because you have to give it some kind of name, fine, but that doesn't prove everything that Christians say. It doesn't claim, doesn't necessarily mean that God has, and I quote, any of the properties normally ascribed to God. Omnipotence, omniscience, goodness, creativity of design. To say nothing of such human attributes as listening to prayers, forgiving sins, and reading our inmost thoughts. And Dawkins has a point there. That, yeah, sure, something created the universe, but the question is, how do we know anything about that something anyways? How do we know about God? What can we tell about God? Because even though that something created the universe... That something could be any number of different things. And there's a lot of popular theories. One is that the thing that created the universe was an unintelligent force. This is what I would call the weak atheist position. That, yes, yeah, something created the universe, but it wasn't intelligent uh, or deliberate. It's just a force. A second popular thing is that the universe created itself. This is sometimes known as pantheism. That the universe is responsible for its own existence. Another is that maybe an advanced race of alien beings created our universe. And then another one, maybe a single powerful being, such as Christians claim, created our universe. Well, how are we going to know? Is it possible that there's any evidence within creation about its creator? Pablo Picasso, famous artist, what he would do when he'd paint a masterpiece is that he would leave his fingerprint on it so you would know it was his. Well, did God leave any fingerprints in creation? There's an old saying from the Bible that says this. 3,000 years ago, David wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Well, let's take a look at the universe. Let's see if there are any fingerprints as the Bible claims. Now, before we really do, we're going to be talking about some pretty big numbers. And I, I want to get a grasp on these. Now, all of us have heard of millions and billions and trillions. But I'm not sure if we really, really have a, a good understanding about exactly how big these numbers are. Take a million, for example. How long ago do you think was a million seconds ago? 11 days. Actually, <laughs> 12 days. Okay. How long ago would be a billion seconds? Well, some might be thinking that a billion seconds would be, you know, a, a few months. Um, but it would be quite a bit longer. It would be sometime in 1982. Well, how long ago is a trillion year, trillion seconds ago? Now, a lot of people might be thinking, if a billion seconds ago is 1982, well, then maybe a trillion seconds would be, oh, I don't know, maybe in the 1600s. A trillion seconds ago is actually 30,000 BC. Wow. That's how long ago is a trillion seconds. Like, we're going to be talking about some very, very big numbers. So, with these big numbers, let's take a look at some pretty big places. Now, this is the Earth. If you had a road that went all around the earth in a straight line, that road would be 40,000 kilometers long. And if you were driving at typical highway speeds and you put in some very long days, driving around the entire planet earth would take you about a month. And if that's a long distance, something else, the earth is actually has a lot of volume to it too. If you cut the earth up into cubes of one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer, so which is like twice as high as the tallest building on earth, the earth would contain one trillion of those one kilometer cubes. The earth is pretty big. Well, take a look at Jupiter. If there was a road around Jupiter, that road would be 400,000 kilometers long. If you were going to drive all the way around Jupiter, Jupiter would take you over a year to make it all the way around. And how much bigger is Jupiter than the Earth? Well, you can fit 1,000 planet Earths inside Jupiter. Now take a look at the sun. 
If you had a road all the way around the sun, that road would be 4.5 million kilometers long. If you were to drive along that road, putting in very, very long days, it would take you over a decade of driving to get around the sun. And how big is the sun? Well, you can fit 1.3 million planet Earths inside the sun. That's how big our sun is. And our sun, sometimes we've, we've heard that the sun is actually a pretty, pretty normal-sized star. It's not, actually. It's actually bigger than 90% of the stars in our galaxy. So it's a, it's a big, big, big star. Well, if we've got big things here, you should see the distances. Take a look at the moon. If we had a road that went straight from Earth to the moon, um, that would be a road that would be 384,000 kilometers long. And if you were going to drive to the moon, it would take you about 11 months. If we had a road to the sun, that road would be 150 million kilometers. If you were going to drive to the sun, it would take you 342 years to get there. If we had a road to planet Neptune, the farthest planet out in our solar system, if you were going to drive to Neptune, it would take you 10,000 years to get there. That's how far away it is. Our solar system is pretty big, but obviously driving around the universe in a car isn't going to work. We're going to need something just a little bit faster. Well, as it turns out, the fastest thing in the entire universe is the speed of light. The speed of light is about 10 million times faster than the posted speed limit out on the highway. It works out to be 1 billion kilometers an hour. That's how fast the speed of light is. It's so fast that if you were traveling at the speed of light around the earth, you could go around the earth eight times every second, just like this. That's how fast it is. At the speed of light, you can get from here all the way to the moon in just one second. If you are going at the speed of light to our nearest stellar neighbor, the nearest star, traveling at the fastest speed in the entire universe with no stops, no potty breaks, just going as fast as you could, you would get to the absolute closest star in four years. Now, why four years? Well, that's because the closest star to us is 50 trillion kilometers away. Driving by car to the closest star would take you 114 million years. So four years at light speed is pretty fast. Now, the nearest star to us isn't actually that exciting. If we want to see something cool, we're going to have to go a little further. If we travel out 8,000 light years away, we can get to a star called Ede Carinae. Ede Carinae is so big that you can fit five million of our suns inside of it. It is massive. And if you think that's a big star, there's another star called NML Cygni. And NML Cygni is so vast, you can fit 10 billion of our suns inside of it. It is massive. But as it turns out, stars aren't even close to the biggest things in our universe. Take a look at our galaxy. It's called the Milky Way. And it's really, really big. We estimate, and we're not exactly sure, that there are between 100 and 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. If you were traveling around the Milky Way galaxy, at the speed of light, it would take you 400,000 years to go around it just once. It's huge. Well, let's look at one of our closest galactic neighbors, Andromeda. Now, by closest galactic neighbor, I'm talking about something that is 2.5 million light years away. So if the closest star is four light years away, closest galactic neighbor, 2.5 million, we're talking about big on a whole new level. Andromeda has approximately one trillion stars in it. It is huge. And when you look at it in the night sky, it would look something like this. Now, the reason why we don't normally look up in the sky and see something that is six times the diameter of the moon is because of interstellar dust. It's actually quite dim. 
But if it wasn't so dim, that's how big it would be. It would just dominate our skies. And as big as Andromeda is, if we want to see a really big galaxy, we're going to take a look at something called IC 1101. IC 1101 is 6 million light years in diameter. You can fit 14 million Milky Way galaxies inside the IC 1101 galaxy. It is a monster. And as big as that is, we can get bigger. You see, just as a galaxy is a collection of stars, there's something called a collection of galaxies called a galactic supercluster. We live in a galactic supercluster called Laniakea. Laniakea is 500 million light years wide, and it contains approximately 100,000 galaxies in it, each of them with hundreds of billions of stars. It is incredibly huge. We estimate that it has approximately 40 quadrillion stars in it. And if we think Laniakea is big, let me tell you a little about something called the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. The Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, if you took Laniakeas and you had 20 of them lined up side by side by side by side, that's how big the Great Wall is. It is 10 billion light years wide. It's absolutely massive. Well, how big is our universe? Well, our universe, the furthest thing that we've seen so far is about 30 billion light years away, which means that the universe is at least 60 billion light years across and maybe even a larger 95 billion light years across. We think that our universe contains 200 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars or more. Our universe is absolutely colossal. And what does all of this tell us about God? Well, God gives us a bit of a challenge. He says this, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name? Who else has held the oceans in his hand? And who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? The universe is big, but God is really big. Makes us think back of that saying 3,000 years ago, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I don't know what kind of problems you have in your life. I don't know what kind of struggles you face I don't know how big or powerful you imagine your enemies to be, but I do know that compared to the God who created this universe, our problems are nothing. Well, what does this really tell us about God? Well, I think it tells us at least three things about God. One is that God is transcendent. That means because God created time and space itself, God exists outside of time and space. God exists outside of the entire universe. Two, God is imminent. That means because God had the ability to create the universe in the first place, that means an extra-universal cause had an intra-universal effect. Something that happened outside of the universe had an effect in the universe because he created the universe itself. This means that God has the ability to interact with the universe he created. Because creating it is interacting with it. Three, and this is the obvious one, God is powerful, really powerful. Now, we've seen some flawed explanations here that nothing whatsoever might have created the universe. That just doesn't make very much logical sense. The idea that the universe created itself doesn't make a lot of sense either because how does the universe cause its existence before it exists? I don't know about you, but I didn't exist before I existed. And neither did the universe. So how does something that doesn't exist create a universe? How does something that doesn't exist do anything at all? Well, logically, it can't. So that the universe create itself, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
Well, that leaves us sort of with two different possible explanations. One of the explanations is what I'd call the weak atheist position, and that is that while something created the universe, and you can call it God if you want, that something was a blind and unintelligent force. That's what created the universe. Or the theistic position that the universe was created by an intelligent being on purpose. Well, how can we possibly tell if any given event has a random or an intelligent cause? Well, it turns out there's a lot of people who do this professionally, that this is how they live their lives. One, SETI scientists. SETI scientists are scientists who use radio telescopes to look for alien life. And they've come up with a bunch of different protocols because they need to be able to tell the difference between just random radio static and a signal from an intelligent source. Cryptographers, guys who break secret codes and make secret codes, they've developed great skills in being able to tell the difference between a random number and a number that only seems random. Casinos. Casinos are really, really good at detecting whether something is random or not. Uh, they have a very, very good idea between the difference between a lucky streak and somebody who's cheating. And you know what? And most of us can kind of do this intuitively. I used to live on the West Coast, and when I lived out there, I used to take walks along the beach. And the West Coast, because of all the logging, the beach is strewn with lots of driftwood. And although technically I know that any specific arrangement of that driftwood um, is going to be horribly improbable, I still don't think anything of it, and neither should I. However, if I was going to see an arrangement of sticks on the beach that spelled out, Jim loves Becky, <laughs> I would have reasonable cause to assume that there was an intelligent agent, probably named Jim, that did that. I would have to be really a special kind of moron to conclude that the best explanation for this is that, you know, random sticks just happen to flop out that way. Okay, we can usually tell when something's up and something's going on. Well, imagine we're playing a game of cards, a really simplified game of poker. And in the first hand, you deal the cards, and your pair of sixes beats my pair of threes. You take my 20 bucks. Then I deal the cards, and surprise, surprise, I deal myself a royal flush, the best possible hand in all of poker. Now, you could go your entire life without seeing a royal flush. Uh, the odds of getting a royal flush are only one in 650,000. You'd have to play a lot of poker to see one. But I get a royal flush, I'm lucky, I take your money. Next time I deal the cards, I get another royal flush. The odds of getting two royal flushes in the row are one in 422 billion. I take your money. I deal the cards a third time, and well, lucky, lucky me, I get another royal flush. The odds of me getting three, three of those in a row are in the hundreds of quadrillions against. I take your money. Now, the question I have for you is, are you going to play a fourth hand with me? <laughs> because if you are, then let me tell you, you are exactly the kind of person I want to play cards with. <laughs> now, you're going to kind of wonder if something's up. This just doesn't seem to be a random shuffling of the deck here. Well, what happens when we look, take this kind of reasoning and look at the universe? Is there any evidence that the creator of the universe stacked the deck? Well, let's take a look at something we know as the force of gravity. As it turns out, the force of gravity has been very, very finely tuned. We live in what I'd call a Goldilocks universe. If the force of gravity was just a tiny, tiny bit stronger, the universe would have collapsed back in on itself as soon as it was created. If the force of gravity was just a tiny bit weaker, the universe would have just expanded into a fine mist and no stars would have ever formed. No planets, no life. How fine tuning am I talking about? Well, the force of gravity was tuned to a specificity of 1 to 10 to the 60th. 
That's the number 10 with 60 zeros after it. That's how precise the universe and the force of gravity was created. To talk a little bit more in our terms, if the universe, the force of gravity was just randomly lucky, that's kind of like winning the Lotto 649 Week after 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 week. Actually, doing that is actually a thousand times easier than randomly getting the force of gravity just right. And if that's a problem, let's look at something called the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant governs the expansion rate of the universe. The fine-tuning of the cosmological constant is 1 to 10 to the 120th which is a 10 with 120 zeros behind it. If we had a galactic lottery and we had to pick just one atom in the entire universe at random and somebody else had to pick that same atom, well, we figured there's about 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire universe. Well, getting one out of those would be approximately a million duodectillion times easier than randomly getting the cosmological constant just right. And if that's bad, when we look at the balance between mass and energy in the creation of the universe, the chances of getting that precisely right is 10 to the 10 to the 123rd. That is the number 10 with 10 to the 123rd zeros. There aren't enough pieces of paper on the entire planet to even write that number down. In fact, there aren't enough atoms in the universe to write that number down. That is how improbable of getting those numbers just right to allow the permission of life. And many, many celebrated scientists have recognized this. Sir Martin Rees said, wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. Stephen Hawking said, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. David Deutsch said, anyone who claims not to be surprised by the special features the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. Sir Frederick Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with the physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The number ones calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put the conclusion almost beyond question. There is, for me, powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems that though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe, the impression of design is overwhelming. Well, why doesn't everybody then believe in the intelligence of the creator. Well, there is a very common objection to this, and it actually features on this month's uh, cover of Skeptic Magazine. And that is, maybe we don't live in a universe, we live in a multiverse. Maybe there are lots of universes. Well, to understand this, let's take a look at the Lotto 649 again. Your chances of winning the Lotto 649 are one in 14 million. Really, really unlikely. However, somebody wins a lot of 649 almost every week. Well, why is that? That's because there are millions and millions of tickets sold every week. So one of them will probably win. Well, what if, yeah, the odds of getting the universe just right for life are horribly improbable, but what if there's gazillions of universes out there? What if there's lots of universes? And sure enough, the vast, 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 vast majority of them can't support life, but One of them had to be lucky, and we just happened to live in the lucky universe. Well, that's an interesting theory. Now, one might ask, do we have any evidence for the multiverse? Are there, can we measure it? Can we detect it? Can we prove its existence in any way? And the answer is no, we can't. It's just an idea. Does believing in this multiverse, does that lead us to good rational thinking? Well, I don't know. Let's go back to our poker game. I have just played three royal flushes in a row. And you figured out that the chances of me doing that are 1 in 274 quadrillion against. Okay? You accuse me of cheating. All right, fair enough. 
But what if I come up with an argument that what if there are at least 274 quadrillion different universes out there and we're playing cards in all those universes? <laughs> in at least one of those universes, I had to be lucky. Uh, this just happens to be the lucky universe. <laughs> are you going to buy that line of reasoning? If so, I have got to play cards with you. <laughs> you are exactly my kind of card player. Uh, most of us just aren't that gullible. Well, then what's going on here? Well, I think there's something beyond the issue of facts and evidence uh, and looking at things objectively. I think there's something very emotional uh, at the heart of this. Harvard professor Richard Lewontin once said that he and others like him will gladly reject common sense, accept absurd theories, deal with failed plot promises, and accept unsubstantiated claims because of their absolute faith in atheism. Regardless of where the facts and evidence lead, they cannot, and I quote, cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That anything is preferable to believing in God. Which is funny, because about 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul talked about this very attitude. He said, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yet claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they traded the truth about God for a lie. What's so odd about us as people is that we're pretty wise about not betting 20 bucks in an obviously crooked poker game. But we will bet our entire lives on the odds, the incredible odds of betting against God not existing. We're betting something more than 20 bucks. And why would we be so wise with 20 bucks but so foolish with our lives? I don't think I've told many of you, anything that you didn't already know deep, deep inside. I think we knew the universe was big, maybe didn't know a lot of the details. Uh, but we've also known deep inside that God is real. That is a knowledge put on our heart, that God is real. But maybe the problem is not that God is real. The problem is that you hate God. I know I used to hate God. I used to be an atheist. I was an atheist for years. And the funny thing was that when I stopped believing in the tooth fairy, I didn't start spewing out hateful anti-tooth fairy, prop fairy propaganda. <laughs> I didn't bother hating in something that doesn't actually exist. But boy, I sure hated God when I didn't believe in him. I hated God because of the pain in my life. I hated God because of my suffering. I hated God because he kept good things away from me. I hated God because he put unreasonable demands on my life. I hated God because I didn't feel he was there for me. I hated God because he wounded my pride. I'm not the one who's wrong. They're wrong. It's not my fault. It's their fault. I just want to have fun. I hated God because God was my enemy. But when I hated God, God loved me. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that even when we were his, still his enemies, Christ died for us. The good news that the Bible tells us about is that this God who created the universe actually entered into it. He became one of us. He walked with us. He talked with us, he laughed with us, he lived with us, and he died with us. No, he died for us. He died instead of us. I don't know what kind of issues you have in your life, what kind of wounds you carry. I don't know what kind of cloak of shame or embarrassment you have in your life. But I do know that despite all of that, God loves you. And God has given us an opportunity. 
God can take all that hurt, all that shame, all the things you've done that you knew were wrong, all the things you didn't do that you knew were right. God can take all of that and nail that to the cross. All you have to do is turn away from your way of doing things and accept his. To take your life, all your hopes and your dreams and put them into the hands of a loving God. And when you do that, he will make you whole. He will give you a new start, a clean slate and a new life. I'm gonna lead you all through a prayer right now that is so powerful that it can change your entire destiny, that it can change everything. Will you bow with me and pray? Dear God, I know I've messed up. I know there's things in my life I'm not proud of. I know I've done things my own way and my own way hasn't gone anywhere. I'm sorry for the things I've done. I want to try a new way. I want to follow you instead. Take my life. Heal me. Forgive me. Fill me. Use me. Amen.